I've only known them to be like deep down. But you can get them in like aquariums. So like, look at how cute. You could put that in your home aquarium. Aw, that's really cute. Right? And they section onto stuff and they come in like yellows and pinks and greens. I have a friend of mine that raises amphipods. Really? Really. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. It's a very interesting field to get into. Yeah, it's very niche. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, Dan raises isopods. Wow, lots of cottage. Yeah. Uh, you know. He's really into composting and things. So. <laughs> but Matt raises amphipods. He makes, he composts his own stuff. Or he like takes it to a place that composts it. Uh, he keeps them in his closet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think his girlfriend likes it too much. <laughs> I kept a, a colony of bioluminescent back, um, what were they? I guess they were back, okay. I don't remember what, actually what they were. Um, but I had a group of bioluminescent uh, phytoplankton that I kept the culture in my house as art for a year and a half or so. It's kind of fun. Every time you turn the light off, you walk over and thumped it and the whole thing would glow. Cool. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah, seriously. It sounds awesome, but then it's in your house. So? I don't know, like. But then it's in your I try house. to. I try to keep insects out of my house. I don't know. I call them insects. They're plankton. They're plants. Yeah, it's basically like a house plant. Oh, it's a bath of pathies, which we have not seen yet. I believe today. Uh, pushing a bit there. But of I had a very super pretty glass, um, blown glass jar, and I put the plankton in there. What's that? That's yeah, awesome. I have. Taking aquarium to the next level. Yeah. Well, they're actually super easy to keep. They didn't require filtration or anything. You just put them in a put a put a lamp on them and do a water change once every couple of weeks. They were way easier than any kind of aquarium yeah, I've ever had. Uh, go take there. I want to give that a try. So it looks like there's something either living on an arm or some tissue missing on on, on there that I'm. Yeah, that not little sure red what's dot. going on there. I think something's missing from there. We, I can't really tell. Uh, the tissue might just be. Li we might be seeing bare skeleton, or something. Is my, or it's a little bit anemone wrapped around it. Mm. Yeah, I guess that's, that's, that's bare skeleton. Yeah, that's so, bare skeleton. So, so it must be definitely yeah, an associate of some type. Push in a bit more. Right. Up. You guys good back yep, there? Here we are. Okay. You can go away. Oh, okay. So I'm reading that actually the Monterey Bay Aquarium exhibits are not under pressure. Oh. They specifically choose um, animals that can adapt to surface pressures, and all of them do just fine. I wonder, are they able to reproduce, or is this like every couple of years they have to go back down, grab some new specimens? I don't know. Let me keep reading. Let me see what's going on. To my lump sucker friend, who also loves lump, su lump suckers. Thank you. They're so cute. I love lump fish. Push in there. Okay. Everyone. 
and happy. Moving on. Yep. Are you moving again on it? Or is it? Roger. <laughs> Can you uh, come up five there? I'm lagging, I gotta get run over here. Deck Chief Mike, if you are listening, we appreciate the smiley face on the back deck. So here's another one of the Paragorgias that around here seem to almost always have um, some kind of secondary colonization by uh, zoanthid. I don't remember seeing that anywhere else that's this common, um, where you almost every one of these we've seen has um, some kind of secondary colonization on it. This one also appears to have another one of those, what is presumed a cephalopod egg case, uh, along with Go in, uh, tight there. normal snake star associate. An egg case. Oh, hi. Is it already hatched out? It mm. appears to, yeah. It looks like an, uh, a pistachio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're good. Thank you. Right there. Okay, so we have a joke going back to Coralie's. Why does it look so sad? Why do all deep sea fish have frowny faces? Why? Because they live under pressure. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so horribly bad. <laughs> bad jokes for the win. Last year, I got to make a series of TikTok videos for Nautilus where it was me surprising people and just being like horrible bad dad jokes. So like one of them was Lynette was sleeping and like I come running into her room. I'm like, Lynette, wake up. I got a joke. <laughs> <laughs> You know you loved it, Lynette. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I was having the best dream. <laughs> I don't even remember what was the joke. I just <laughs> I remember being woken up. <laughs> <laughs> I just loved your reaction. You just closed your curtain on me. <laughs> 
I don't even remember the joke either, but it was so funny. <laughs> Okay, so I'm reading a lot more about this. I'm just taking I'm a deep dive into deep the deep sea of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Exactly. So I'm not completely sure about the procreating. However, they do mention that this is an ever-evolving ex exhibit. So they're continuously changing the organisms that are living in the deep sea environment. In oh. And because of that, there's like kind of an issue of how do you keep the environment any, good for all of the organisms or how do you keep it good well, uh, if you don't know what like organisms are going to be there in the next month or so. So they have this like all these really cool techniques to make to kind of tailor it to the organisms they have. So mm -hmm. one of the things that they'll do is they measure a lot. They measure uh, the waters for trace metals, oxygen, pH, temperature. So they're getting exactly, or maybe like if, if some corals need some more calcium, they'll put more calcium in the water. But it's kind of interesting reading how they create an oxygen minimum zone. Wow. Um, how they like change the pH. And then for me, I study trace metals. So they talk about measuring the trace me metals, they use inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometry, spectrometry, which is interesting for me because I use something similar but also different. I use, instead of optical emission spectrometer, I use a so mass spec. Me a bit. Looks like so we got a nice wall here. It's a good time to have the boat stopped. This is very, oh. very interesting, but they get the yeah, we'll play around trace the metals just right. Here. Trace metals are actually uh, micronutrients. You have your macronutrients and your micronutrients. Ooh, we just hit a big old wall. I know. Wow. Wait, this is crazy. That's like straight up. There's to be a coral, coral right here. The only one in sight. I love all this that you were talking about the Monterey. Like, that's so cool. And it just sounds like such groundbreaking science to have this as an aquarium. I know. I mean, I'm just wondering if like 50 years ago, people ever expected to, <laughs> to have be, this. Yeah, to have an exhibit at an aquarium of just full of deep sea organisms. And like how much in 50 years, I mean, oceanography wasn't even that big of a, a field. And we need just to ask Robert Waters, because he said he started on the Alvin back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So pretty close to 50 years. Be like, hey, when you were diving on the Alvin as a young whippersnapper, <laughs> did you ever think that this was possible? Sorry, go away and I choked there, <laughs> literally. Okay, I'll try again. Is this a plexor? I think it's a Chrysogorgia with zooanthids. That's, that's what I was gonna say. Okay. No, I, I think know. I think the, the clearer things are actually the zoanthid in this case. Oh. If you look at the base, I think oh. the I think this is I would have called it a plexorid under the old taxonomy. Um, I think this is actually a paramaricia under the latest revision, and this might be actually the genus Paramarcia, uh as well. I'm pretty sure this is what we sampled two dives ago, so I don't think we need to take a sample of it, but this is the first one we've seen on this dive. Um, so that's a, a, a new observation for this particular seamount. Um, but this one definitely had me confused for a minute. I had to study it. All right, I think we're good, thank you. Okay, go line, thanks.
like vanilla bean flavored. You don't like coffee? Um, I'm more of an iced coffee person. I like it. You're not an ice cream person? No, I'm more of an iced coffee. Like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Have you seen Paola's drink with the, the milk and like right. the instant coffee? No. That was mine. That was yours? I made the whipped coffee this morning. Oh, I was going to say, she made this the other day, though. Oh, never mind. Uh, yeah, yeah she made it. looked really yummy. Did you whipped coffee? Cruise? Or what did she do? Uh, I don't need much of a look. A floating zoom should be fine. I'm pretty sure I know what this is. All right. Here. Plain jigs. Yep, that's all I need. Yeah, this is a prototelum. Mm. We, uh... I've seen several of these and sampled a couple of them, not on this expedition, but we 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 had trouble identifying it across a couple of cruises the last few years, and so we targeted, sampled those quite a bit here Darryl, you can in the Line in Islands and, and just in a little the, bit, uh, and then in the Phoenix Islands. Yeah, a little more. Perfect. So I can see the. Uh, the light field out in front of her is good enough. Any tighter than that, I can't see where I'm going. Spoiled with the second ROV there. Does the ROVs record uh, any audio, or is it just pictures and videos? It is indeed recording audio. There's a camera, the pilot's camera has a microphone. Is it only to like hear the instrumentation of the ROVs or possibly? Sorry, oh, sorry. what's that? I can't hear. Oh no, sorry. Can't hear you. Uh, since the ROVs are recording audio, does oh, it is it used for anything other than like mechanical stuff? Is, is it also used for biological? No, it's just uh, happens to be a microphone in the camera. I recorded <laughs> some the other day. You can. The only re really useful thing is. Uh, if you're bonking around with a manipulator, you can hear the sound of the manipulator hitting the rocks, so you know when you're touching. Other than that, it's just the sound of the hydraulic power unit and the thrusters. Gotcha. 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 Sounds a lot like it does on deck. Edie Witter has done a decent amount of work documenting the different sound levels of different vehicles, and the moral of the story is they're loud and anything that's super sound sensitive and highly mobile is probably going to run. I just bought her book on Amazon the other day. In fact, I think it was yesterday. Yeah, I'm ready to, to read it when I get back home. It's got a shrimp here in a hole. Yeah. Probably a nematocarcinus shrimp. Can uh, do a laser zoom on the shrimp there. Yep. Those, see those super long legs? Oh my gosh. Push in just a bit. Whoa. More. Yeah, perfect. Laser still on the top Whoa. of the. Whoa. Looks like a daddy long there. leg trip. It does. <laughs> <laughs> That's good for me, thanks. Okay, it can go away. That was so neat. Daddy long leg shrimp. Is that a common type of shrimp down here? Fairly, yeah. Okay. So Brian, the other the other book that I bought on Amazon yesterday was Fluke, the Singing Whales, or Why Does the Winged Whale Sing? That book is hilarious. I need to. <coughs> I haven't read it since college. I should reread it. Can, uh, come up it was screen. definitely one of the funnier books I've ever read, so but from the point of view of a marine biologist, I don't. I'm not sure if you're not a marine biologist, it'll be quite as funny, but. But that was definitely a laugh out loud, repeatedly, kind of <laughs> book. Good. Earlier, me and Jules were in the conversation about funny books and because all of us brought on these very serious sad books and she was looking for a funny book and we could not really find too many on on board Do 
a quick laser zoom there if you want. What do we have here? Looks cucumber? like Olive. a sea cucumber. They look so yeah. They look so beautiful and majestic when they're swimming. And then when they're okay. just sitting there eating their sand, they just look like husky, husky little blobs. What we haven't seen yet that I've been actually looking for is a Pelagothuria, which is a, um, a sea cucumber, highly derived sea cucumber that lives its entire life in the, in the water column and uh, eats marine snow. So it just filters marine snow and never lands uh, on the seafloor. And they are gorgeous but we have not seen one yet. We might be a touch deep here. Yeah, you keep teasing us with this thing. I really, really want to see it. Slide off to your um, to your left a little bit there. Copy that. I'll come around a bit to follow. Thank you. Brian, as we're cruising around, we have a, an online viewer who says that they're seeing a lot of xenophilophores. Yep, definitely, definitely seen more than a few. So what exactly are xenophilophores for our online viewers? They are um, really kind of a unique creature. Um, they are one of the largest single-celled organisms we know of. Uh, I think they may be the largest. Um, they're a member of, um, they're a type of foraminifern, um, and they are, as we talked about the other night, they're multinuclei unicellular organisms. Slimy. And they are slimy. And they cover themselves in sediment, um, connect themselves to their tests. So Xenophyophore actually means bearer of foreign bodies. Ooh. That's where the name comes from. So are they filter feeders? Yep. Some kind of, actually, no, I'm not sure how much they're filter feeders versus detritivores. Um, and so if they're a type of um, Formanifera, then Formanifera's are just shelled amoebas. Do uh, lasers in there as we pass over. I got this. What are we doing? <laughs> Good, thanks. Okay, you can go wide. Hey, Adam. Long time no see. Adam, did you get some of the ice cream coffee? I did. It was very good. I am slowly over here enjoying it. Uh -huh. It is delicious. We heading to four? Uh, no, lasers in there. Bypass the four, going straight to five. Mm. Uh, okay. Oh, kind of wanted to see. Up that slope from four. Yeah. Right there. Okay, go away. I like how they keep swimming like sideways. Oh, the the shrimp? Yeah. They're so funny. Did you okay, so a few minutes ago we saw a daddy long leg shrimp. Oh. Not a not a real name for it, but <laughs> Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, pretty accurate description, right? Yeah. 
I had never seen one of those. I thought they were awesome. Yeah, they have a specific family. Um, but I don't have that up right now. Let's see. Set By the way, this is Sarah filling want. in for Coralie. That one's to be going the right way here. Still swimming sideways. Oh, that one's a different one. Um, saw a bunch of those today. Also, <laughs> kind of a camel shrimp. It's got a bit of a hump on its camel back. Shrimp. Yeah. Oh, we had yeah, a viewer tell cool. us what their common name is, and I don't think I can repeat it on SPL, Let's but do, it's pretty uh, funny, and it makes total meter sense. Steps, please. Oh, <laughs> right. Not too bad. Can you spell it? We just had a beer can <laughs> on camera. Copy that. <laughs> Uh, starts with the letter D. Think beer can. Beer can, starting with D. Or, I th I, you're not, really? I don't know. I don't want to. Yeah. Plus, I like the, maybe I like the ambiguity oh. of it. Okay. Interesting. But I think we're good. Okay, can go wide. Yeah, it's part of so what is its actual name? Uh, Red shrimp. Oh, if it has a home thing. Oh, but that's this death doesn't match. Oh, I like this one better. So they said instead of saying it's a D shrimp, it is a intoxicated shrimp. Oh. There we go. <laughs> Paragorgia? Um not sure. Zoom on one of these uh, corals in front of us. Yeah, I think Can you uh, hold position, please, now? Yeah. I think the one is just a black coral. The other one is definitely a paragorgia. I think they're both paragorgia, but one's zoanthidid. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I say yes, like I am a true <laughs> science yes. expert. Yes, 100% correct. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Man, that still camera is a thing of beauty. <laughs> I know, man. You, you were taking too long. <laughs> I did. I just wanted. Left or right? Okay, I just wanted uh, <laughs> Brian to get it. Uh, the right, I'm sorry. Right. The left is definitely paracordia. Okay, there, I can zoom in on the right guy there. This one. Um, yeah, paracordia with zoanthids. Zoanthids or, or anemones? Um, zoanthids. Zoanthids, yeah. They kind of look similar, but they're way smaller. All right, we're good. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. So, Adam, we have a question for you. What's that? Oh. Do you yep. ever encounter parts of the ocean floor with less ferromanganese than this? Oh, yes. Most of my career, I've worked on uh, mid-ocean ridges, which are the youngest parts of the seafloor, and there's no ferromanganese crust to be found. And will you explain how do uh, mid-ocean ridges form? Mid-ocean ridges uh, form where two tectonic plates are separating or pulling apart, and as they separate and drag the mantle away uh, underneath, new mantle rises up. 
And when it gets to a low enough pressure, it starts to melt and produce magma. And so some of the plate separation is accommodated by injections of new magma and some of it by faulting and thinning the crust. Yeah, you get that beautiful little zipper line formation, all those uh, great mountains on either side. What you got there, sea pen? Yeah, that's one of the sea pens that they collected. Um, I didn't catch what ID they gave it, but definitely a sea pen. <laughs> What ice cream did you eat today? I had all the ice creams. Okay, me too. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> there's a soft coral. coral and oh, a chonoclops behind it. <gasps> oh my gosh. We have <coughs> or chonococks, fish. I can't remember how you say it. I say chonoclops. Chonococks, but not sure if it's that genus. I think it is though. Oh, and you're the one who corrected my uh, previous <laughs> identification. I know, I know, I know. Definitely want to zoom oh, that's on that a little, little yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah, Roger. If you uh, stop surfing the internet on the DSC and put the image back up there, I can uh, center it up. Got it. Sorry. It's uh, very distracting. Oh. Here oh. For us. oh, there it goes. Scared it. <laughs> can we zoom on it swimming? or? Yeah, you can do a laser zoom there, Daryl. Yeah, it's all right. Oh, there's its little angler thing is out. Oh, yeah. Chonacops, Chonacops. It's we a Chonacops. <laughs> yes, Katie. It's it a Chonacops. A <laughs> We've been looking at it for like yes, a Katie, minute for before like you. a whole two minutes. I'm sorry, I was <laughs> chit chatting on the side. <laughs> but there goes. A bit more. I almost missed the Chonacops because of Lynette. Yeah. Lynette, I blame this on, yeah. totally on oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is the coolest thing. I have, okay, this is what I wanted the entire expedition. I mean. I can stay, that's fine. Yeah, they're cool. Oh, you know I what? Mean, I mean, on this watch we have seen the whale fossil, the octopus, the solitary hydrozoid. They're fun, but yeah, we saw it. It's going. They're so cool. Yeah, it's uh, actually swimming. We never get to see it swim. Move the boat 25 or 20 when you get a chance. Look at those little fishy kneecaps are going. Swimming sideways. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah, you heard me, bud. Right now we're chasing the fish. <laughs> I thank you for chasing the fish. It just looks like a little water balloon with fins. Yeah, they're cute. <laughs> <laughs> so for Christmas, uh, there's a lady on Etsy, and she does like the, the crochet, and she crochets these guys, the Chonacops. Oh. So I gave everybody Chonacops for Christmas <laughs> this year. That's like cute. every baby shower I got invited to, I'm like, you get a Chonacops and you get a Chonacops. Well, you can do Come better next year. A few more meters. <laughs> <laughs> down. Are you going to yeah. hand knit me something? Pen. Yeah, rocks. <laughs> I actually, uh, so because I bought so many of the Chonacops and her other creation, she gave me like Need living, she gave me knitted rock ones. Ooh, I know it was a would be fun, was a but, living um, rock. Not not necessary. What's that? I'm just gonna say if it lands, I still can't picture it would be fun, but it's not necessary. I know we have places to be, so. Not but really. It's a We're exploring. Chonacops. Come on, mom. It's a chonacops. <laughs> just look at that cute little face. Don't you just want to go up and like squish its little cheeks? And it's swimming. We never get to see them swim. This is my five-year-old Katie five. voice. <laughs> <laughs> so stinking adorable. All right, you can let it go. Yeah. Oh, bye, friend. Bye, little one. Thank you for showing yourself to us. Like this was this was what I wanted the whole expedition. <laughs> but sadly, instead, I got whale fossils. So. That's so unfortunate. I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, we, we're good. Again, all the cool stuff happens on this shift. That uh, happens to be the way we're going. Oh, cool. Oh. Lead the way, China Cops. <laughs> <laughs> we will follow you. Just waiting for the shift to move. So I get to stay here and, and watch the China Cops swim some more. Yeah, they're fun. Five. They're Copy fun. that. Hauling five. I'm like, I'm like, 
hear in your tone, I don't think you think they're yeah. fun. I, I think the Tonicops did something to you in the past. No. <laughs> Stole they your lunch fun. money. So we also saw batfish. Do you think they're fun too? I don't know what those are actually. It was so neat. It looked like a prehistoric fish that had just come to visit us and it was giving us a side eye, like all sassy. Huh. Was that the tripod fish you saw? No, we did see that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. this one. You have your five. Do you want uh, more though? No, no, that is a batfish, uh, no, but deep sea batfish. Copy okay. that. It was super cool. Wait for the ship here. So I have batfish in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, this guy. Oh, cute flatfish. Look at those big old eyes, though. Look at the pupils. <laughs> cute. Yeah, finding vertebrates is fun. <laughs> finding, <laughs> finding the, finding the, char What's the charismatic species. Right here, I'll come now. Charismatic right species are fun for sure. They're cute. Um, something else in the background. I think it's just. Uh, seeing another probably mushroom coral, but yep. overall just rocky terrain. Not many corals around, not many sponges either. Maybe at the top of this thing. Yeah. Um, whoever's on the DSC, that is a ROV instrument network PC, and it's uh, not really cool to use it oh. for internet. Sorry access. about that. We go. Oh, China cops flew away, swam away. Oh, and Ani from Etsy, the the artist that makes the China cop crochet ones. She's online. Hi, oh, Ani. Oh, hey. She's super cool. That's awesome. Like on our ONC expedition a couple of years ago, she made everybody that wanted one an octopus a little hat. For me, Daryl. It Aww. was so cool. I still have mine, and I wear yeah, it all the time in the winter time. Oh, that's cute. Oh, what's going on? Yeah, there? I I don't have the patience to do fabrics oh. work, but I always appreciate it. Yes, I always appreciate it. I don't think I have a lot of patience for it. Hey, anything. Dan, can I circle back to the not using that computer to look up IDs of? organisms i mean if we're gonna have someone back here controlling the camera they kind of need a computer to to do that on too well, we have uh, i mean normally so normally i have a laptop it's just lots of we're computers on the boat but shifts, the but, um, computers that are plugged in to the rov instrument network or um, as far as i know not uh, internet computers oh really oh okay okay well then you can uh Welcome to bring your laptop and Wi-Fi in or use uh, one of the uh, science computers. But it's a um, an ROV instrument network, so it's literally on the same network that's controlling the ROV. And um, it's very distracting. If you want us to uh, frame digital shots with it, uh, it needs to be a uh, digital stills computer. No worries. Roger. Thank you. Uh, otherwise, I'll take it off the front row here, and you can do whatever you want with it. But I think Michael might have Mike might have. Uh, yeah, it's all good. Um, and I think we're coming up on maybe a white paragorgia. Can't quite tell. Looks pretty diluted. Ooh. Thanks for the close up. Yeah, it looks like a, another Paragorgia. It's kind of cool. Um, something smaller. Um, yeah, I think that's a good picture. Thank you. I've been really, I mean, I've been really interested in seeing what types of species are dominant in each area that we kind of come across. And it looks like, I mean, we're seeing a lot of Paragorgia, um, the bubblegum coral, but I also noticed a lot of sea pens. Um, when we were on kind of the ridge side, we were seeing this one type of, um, can't remember the full name. We we're seeing a type of uh, bamboo coral. Or no, nope, it was a Chrysogorgid. Um, but it's really cool to see the gradients and differences and diversity in each community based on where we go. Whew. And 
These are some fun rocks as well. That butteryoidal texture. We can't go a night without saying idol. No. No, we can't. <laughs> And now there's some beautiful, beautiful sand. <laughs> Sediment for days. Yeah, oh. it seems like it seems like we keep cycling between lots of macrofauna and not a lot of macrofauna. Um, something, uh, I think a skeleton. Yeah, something dead on this rock. Push in there a bit. Yeah. I think that's a xenophyre four. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Cool. What? So yeah, I was going to say, is there a reason why, uh, since we just talked about Xenophyophores earlier, is there a reason why you don't I push in as much on them? Like they're just not a high priority species or there's only one species? Uh, I think we just can't tell any of them apart. Don't know much about them, frankly. <laughs> okay, I can go with it. Yeah, good zoom. Thank you. Yeah, that I makes sense. I am sure there are people out there who do a lot of Xenophyophore work, but for the most part, um, they don't catch a lot of interest. They're kind of a little forgotten, honestly. What? Um, are they cnidarians or no? Are they no, sponges? No, they're, they're, form, or, they're forams. Oh, oh, okay. And some sort of... Another pair of gorgi, I think. Push in a bit there, if you huh. want. Yeah. Yep, I agree. Yep. With some cool brittle stars. Mm-hmm. Of the spiky variety. Okay. <laughs> Most likely, yeah. But yeah, overall, there's probably a lot of small things that we're not seeing. Um, I know last time we kind of saw nothing when we took some still cam pictures. We saw stuff close up, like some tunicates and some um, like zoanthids and that sort of thing. But oh, the predatory tunicate that we saw from the other night, and then we took a sample of. Oh that yeah, was I don't so know if cool. I star in the middle there. I, I don't I'm always amazed at the, the small stuff when we bring up the rock samples yeah. actually and take a magnifying glass and go over the rocks and, yep. and find detail all the little tiny things that live. Also on Brian, the I rock. feel like maybe it's just me or I can barely hear you. We've had difficulty uh hearing each it? other kind of all night. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. yeah Never yeah. mind then. No 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 turn it up girl. Mine is up at like well I mean super loud. I can hear him well enough. Just didn't know. But yeah, like the like the baby glass sponges, yep. really cute. Yeah, the oh, baby. Crazy gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy gorgeous. Yeah, not bit. sure what type. Push in a bit there, don't. Just oh. back out just a bit for the lasers are in there. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I think that's as good as a look we're going to get. Probably. Get yep, that's if you want. I, no, I think that's good enough. That's probably crazy gorgeous a lot. Yeah. Of. Thank okay. you. Can go in. Sarah, is there anything of particular interest that you hope to find? Hmm. Um, off the top of my head, not really. Um, hard corals are always fun, I feel like, because they can get really big or really small, like cup corals. Um, I mean, we always have the whale shark the whale manifestation. Shark. Might be a tad deep here. Yeah. <laughs> but it's always there it's in the back of my head <laughs> um, 
You know, anything like we really, I mean, everything is cool, obviously. We're seeing new uncharted territory. Um, but really anything that we haven't seen on this expedition yet, or really that I haven't seen yet, of course, kind of selfish. <laughs> um, but also, yeah, just changes in community patterns are really cool to me. So that's kind of enough for me to just see like what's different between each dive, each site. So since you're not normally on this watch, will you tell uh, the audience at home a little bit about your background and what your role on board is? Yeah, I'm a scientist, like Coralie and like Jules. Um, what is this here? Another sort of star. Um, but my uh, background is that there, I just want. graduated from Temple University in Philadelphia, PA. Um, yeah, this is my first ocean sort of thing. Okay, so this is a non-spiky, nope, this is a spiky brittle star. I don't know what type. No, I think it's Astroschema. Yeah? You're seeing it's tube feet, I think, I not think spikes. I, oh, yeah. Kind of okay. hard to see, In but... Ways. Uh, you want a closer shot? No, no, no that's no, fine. That's good, that's good. Okay. Um, <laughs> and some sort of urchin. I mean, it's an enemy there. Yeah, um, I just graduated. I worked in a deep sea lab for... I did, like, half evolutionary and um, half evolutionary phylogenetics, more medicine-based. I did that for, like, half... Oh, and we have another... Bamboo. Most likely, Something. but certainly can't be sure yeah. from this distance. Yeah. So my graduated, was that your undergrad, graduate? My undergrad, sorry. Um, yeah, did my undergrad. Now I'm here. <laughs> I, I flew out two days after I graduated, you so. Hold so position, awesome. Please, Thanks. Yeah. Can we hold position, please? Pretty looking. Is that a bamboo? Mm. Most likely. Yeah. Usually when they're like this, yeah, but. Ooh. So pretty. I love how these are always pink. All right, that's probably good for us. I do. Yeah. Looks good, thank you. So what is your favorite thing that you've seen so far while on board? Um. Ooh. Um, Whale shark cannot count. I know, well I didn't see that yet, oh, so. Okay. <laughs> um, the Chonicops are really cute. Um, I really like the sea cucumbers that kind of just like float into frame and then float out. And they're kind of just like really random in movement. Those are really fun. Clear or purple? The, um, we, we saw a clear one on one of my watches and it was, you know, it was yeah. kind of like full of sediment. So it looks kind of funny and it was, there was some like really bright red part Still to it. And it was really, Copy. really random in movement. Um, and it literally was in frame for maybe two seconds, and then it just went out of frame, and it was like super close to the ROV too, so it was just funny. But I like sea, cu sea cucumbers in general. They are very fun, very pretty. Another possible bamboo here, most likely. Ooh, different types of, different polyp structure here, actually. Push in this a bit. There you go. You want to guess again? All right, and I'm out. Oh, is that a Possible. black coral? Yep. A medulla day? No. Push in a bit more. Anthropotherium. Close shot there. But. Look at those cool polyps again. Yeah. So this is actually pretty different. Um, this in terms of like relationships. Most of what we're seeing down here are octocorals. These are a type of hexacoral. Oh. Um, oh. Oh. Yeah. 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 So if you notice the tentacle structure here is completely different. You don't have the individual polyps with a whorl kind of thing. There's one mouth for every six polyps, or six tentacles, but it uh, is much harder to kind of see 
of the individual polyp structure on these. Push in just a bit more. That was a nice tenophore or something floating in the water column, too. And here are all the amphipods. Whoa. So something I've remarked There's a couple so times many. on this cruise is the lack of these kind of smaller associates with these corals. And apparently this bamboo coral, is, or bamboo, this black coral is very popular. That is a ton of amphipods. And what was at the base of it? Was that, um, it almost looked like a basket star, feather star, or was it just more branches coming out? Yeah, this is loaded. I'm not sure what, I didn't notice something on the base. Uh, I was too busy looking at the polyps. All right, I think we're good on the polyps. Can we take a look at the base before sure. we depart? Can I go zoom out a bit? Look at the base here. So is it just more branching structures, or it looks crinoids. like crinoids? Okay, cool. My gut instinct was correct. There a bit. All right, we're good. Thank you. Okay, you can go away and text. So, Corley, I'm glad you're back. We had a question for Adam right as Adam was <laughs> heading out. Classic. Let's see if I can answer it. Okay. So, does the manganese deposition over geologic timescales tell us anything about how ocean water the pen, right? might have changed over time? Uh, yeah, quick zoom. Um, go ahead there. That's a great question, and yes. The short answer, yes, but the long answer is Great, that's a little all. bit Thanks. long. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. That's fine. That's all I need. Thank you. Right there. Okay, can go in. So, yes, it can tell us about ocean water over time because uh, the term we use for ferromanganese crust is that it's a hydrogenetic rock, which means it's made and precipitated out of the seawater and onto the rocks you see now uh, over time. So it's actually a sedimentary rock. So it'll precipitate these layers and layers and layers. Um, so each layer, since it's literally made from the seawater, it makes sense that it would tell you something about the seawater. How Pushing much it tells us about the yeah, seawater is what we're trying one. to figure out now. So we're currently, um, like that's what the research is trying to figure out essentially. I think there's a lot of, um, People are really interested in the kind of ore value uh -huh. for manganese crust, but I think there's also kind of a big... Um, and can I... Hold on one second. I'm sorry. I do want to go back to that. What are those white things? Can we sample this? Wait, Please. is that another Absolutely. Yeah, is that a case? case? There's kind of a couple of, on them. Yeah. I have no idea what boxes are open and which ones are not. Thank you. It's always in the way. We've got one of the forward bio boxes and four of the starboard bio boxes open. Roger. Oh, sorry, three. Yeah. Is the uh, floaty or a sinky? I don't know, actually. <laughs> one way to find out. So, Brian, what's your thinking on this coral? Is it because it's unique, or is it because of all the possible egg cases? It's more because it's unique. Um, this is probably some kind of hydrozoan, um, which is another one of those taxa that we often just kind of blow past and don't spend a lot of time on, which is one of the reasons I want to collect it. Um, and the other is it's, it's unique. We haven't seen, I think I saw one of these two or three dives ago, um, but we didn't take a good look at it um, and so I'm relatively sure it's not a, a true coral air quotes um, but I am curious to see it under the microscope and get a confirm it how much of this guy do you want um, can you get it with the egg case yeah
that egg case is also a little different than what I'm used to seeing. Yeah, the other ones the were green. Cases. Do you think it could be still a possible cephalopod egg case? Yeah. You may end up having to take the whole thing down. Not right. sure you'll be able to cut it, which is okay. Uh, cool. You just want to like pull it out? Yeah. I do. I mean, the those two A cases on the bottom Grip look force. very different from Three. the one on the top. Yeah. Something to compare each other to. <laughs> Good point. Is that a polychaete? Yeah. Probably. Oh, another one. Oh, hi. Go, buds, go. So while we normally Stand take... Stand by video. I'll check that. While we normally only take a clipping of these things, sometimes the hold fast and the way an attachment, attachment point is is useful for an ID, so this is so strange. I wanted the whole organism so we could get um, the attachment point as well, and I wanted to ensure we got the egg cases, because um, that's an ongoing question about what exactly um, larger mobile species are using um, these different uh, types of corals um, as you know, habitat, basically, or nurseries for their young. Can you open the front box for us, sir? Copy. It's open. Right on. Chris, you might want to make a note on this one for whoever processes samples. It, this one might be particularly stingy. Kay. Not that we should not that we should be handling them without gloves, but just in case. Dan, go on the uh, Omega side. Uh, starboard side? Roger. Uh, yep, Roger, Roger. All right, so this is a probable hy um, hydroid with, or hydrozoan with um, one intact egg, two old egg cases, um, and what was the number again, sorry? Zero seven nine. And it was sample seven nine. So when we get up to the top, are we gonna be able to look at that egg case through a microscope, or would you possibly cut it open? We'll certainly look at it under the microscope. Um, we'll see when it gets up here. I might want to leave it intact for until the we can get it to a, a cephalopod expert. We'll see how intact it is when it gets to the surface. And cephalopods are some of those rare creatures that can survive the, the journey up to the top from the deep, okay. right? So a lot of things, well, most organisms can survive the pressure change, actually, fish kind of being the exception. Um, it's the temperature that really seems to mess things up more in the invertebrate realm. Okay, box all the way in. Fish yeah. that have swim bladders and stuff like that don't handle it well at all. Um, but a lot of the invertebrates um, don't come up as, you know, mangled or anything. Uh, they seem to be temperature, more temperature sensitive than pressure sensitive on that fashion. Uh, or the 
that pressure changes happen on a, a cellular level and we don't really see it in the gross morphology. So is there any kind of mechanism or has it even is it even considering being done to bring up creatures from the deep and have them survive at the top, like possible temperature or pressure chambers? Yep, absolutely. A couple of different groups have, have experimented with that um, and had some success depending on, up, depending on the type of Copy. organism. Calling five. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium actually has a whole deep sea exhibit now, and they've really been pioneering the way on keeping deep organisms alive on display. Um, I have not been there yet, but it's certainly on my wish list to go to soon. Wait, alive? How, so they keep it in a pressure chamber? Captured under pressure. Yep. Wow. They, they can do the whole husbandry and care of these things. Um, I don't know how much they're just doing temperature and how much they're doing pressure, but they've been able to keep a, a large array of deep sea organisms on display now at, at a Monterey Bay. Wow. And some colleagues at Harvard have done some pressure vessel stuff where they capture things uh, at pressure and keep them there. So definitely people are, are experimenting with that. Ventana was the first ROV I ever operated on the Point Lobos. Nice. Dr. Bruce Robinson. I lasted probably less than five minutes in the chair. <laughs> probably more like 30 seconds. It seemed like hours. And what was the reason for that? Uh, just an intense situation or very difficult to pilot? What's that? I said, and, w and what was the reason for that? Oh, uh, we were trying to, he, his uh, area of expertise was midwater organisms, and uh, he had, they have a Zeus camera on there, but the technique was to um, follow the organism midwater while he zoomed, he zoomed in on it and then fly it into these jars that were mounted on the bumper and then close the doors. Holy moly, that sounds so incredibly intense. I'm sure a lot of adrenaline. So Coralie, earlier we were talking about um, how deposition of different crests on animals can tell us about changes in the ocean right, water. This is a Paragorgia zoanthids. We've seen several of these. Probably not um, the crust on animals. Sorry, on ocean. Oh ocean yeah, floor, yeah. rocks. Just because the crust that's on animals is generally like very little. Uh huh. Um, but, sorry, I'm like looking up Monterey. I know, <laughs> like, it's so, so cool. Why, hello there. Another bump. What's happening? What's that? Oh no, I just keep bumping there. You can see the video jump. So Brian, it come up or look up one or the other. A viewer saying that there are giant isopods at the Monterey Bay petting tanks. Wow, that's so cool. Sorry, too many voices in my head, Katie. We're talking. Yeah. Oh no, I was just saying that uh, there's giant isopods at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, We might be. Do you want me to come down? Sure. Copy. I'm going to pay out. Oh. Come around the other side here. Oh, uh, we shouldn't be tight anymore. Okay. 
Sorry, just talking about some still cam stuff. But yes, okay, so what I was saying before was that I think a lot of people are very interested in the ore value. And so there's been a lot of interest into kind of like critical metals in these rocks, but um, people are also realizing there's a lot that you can use them for in terms of paleo-oceanography, which is like the study of Earth's past climate through, mm -hmm. you know, oceanography. Um, mm -hmm. Camera so there are, I have read some cool papers that there it goes. kind of, it's more of like, I don't know how to describe this in a okay, kind of simple back. way, but um, you can get a lot of uh, different that elements that can kind of clue you into <laughs> uh -huh. different changes the on the earth, even in the terrestrial earth, just based on how dust comes into the ocean. So in terms of volcanology, I remember uh, too, too, too you can do here. you can look at how you can kind of like fingerprint how okay, dust go, from the land comes into subduction zones and then gets re-erupted out at back arc volcanoes, which is pretty interesting. And then I read a paper that was kind of doing a similar that thing that was looking at dust coming I'm off sorry, of that was me back here. I didn't into the, that was the ocean the through time. And that can kind of clue you into Video, different tectonic processes going so on. Oh, that was you last um, time. And I was blaming Daryl. <laughs> no, yes. well, it wasn't me last time. But I didn't <laughs> oh really have control back there. Before. Uh, <laughs> monitor one. Hold on, I can put it back. Uh, sled Zeus. And this like I, I just know. keep pushing buttons till you get what you need. I didn't know who, <laughs> who gave the science control the big monitor. There, technically, those are your monitors. You can put whatever you want up there. Really? Okay. Right. We're we're relegated to the little oh. multi viewers down here. Intriguing. <laughs> well, now that I know I have the power. You do have the power. So this that was nice. the grand plant. Sea cucumber. Oh, I love it. It's just like a big purple glob. Hello. Right, it's well, like the there. caterpillar from A Bug's Life. Oh, I was thinking Hungry was Hungry Caterpillar. Or, yeah. The Eric right. Carl book? The Bug's Life? A Bug's Life, the Pixar One movie? The no, no, no. The, the, the Hungry Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carl. Oh, okay. You're talking about bolt. your thing. <laughs> no, but like, yeah. <laughs> both of us, both of us saying caterpillars. Big fat caterpillars. No, I stuck it in there last minute for a handle. Just look at how we happy have, we it looks. I know, I feel like handle. it's saying hello to us. I really do too. Usually it's not an issue, we're just getting tiny stuff. And it does keep the rocks out of it, but it's obviously an issue, so it needs to come out of there. I kind of want to go boop, like just go squish it. We really don't. Uh, I just grab it. I don't use the handle, but I remember the first cruise I went on. To um, all the one of the scientists operators. was collecting sea cucumbers for yeah. like a, col a colleague. So um, cool. And there, she was storing them in the minus 80 freezer. But I remember just Kay. like they look so squishy. Yeah, <laughs> they came back up. Have you got your fellow purple yet? I could sit here and watch this guy for hours. I know. I love this dude. He's just a husky little friend. So vibrant. This is a chunky, a chunky one. <laughs> okay. Bye, buddy. So yeah, somebody who's been to uh, Monterey Bay is saying that there's giant ice pods, sea angels, giant Japanese spider crabs, Moth stingers, Ocidex bone eating worms. Man, that's so cool. I want to go there now. I haven't been since I was a kid. What's oh, that? I'm so oh, Point Lobos was the name of the vessel that uh, Ventana used to be on. It's now. <coughs> so, this is one of those Proisis crinoid. Crina. <coughs> well, I can't talk. Um, <laughs> We've seen a lot of them over the last couple of days, but this is the first time we've seen one on this dive. Better zoom in on it. Very pretty. Such a vibrant red. I know. It's a nice color red. 
I will agree. If you're going to go red, you got to go Rush. bright. All right, that's good for us. Thanks. I feel like I'm just killing it on the still cam. I really think this is like my new job. <laughs> <laughs> Add that to the LinkedIn profile. Yeah, still cam operator. Seriously. And if you want to like stage shots, like let us know, or then we can hover what? and what no, shot you. I like these like action shots that I'm trying to get. get. It's well, sorry, were you talking to me, Brent? I was not. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but Dan, we always want to talk to you. I have to tone you guys down a little bit. Otherwise, I crash the ROV into the rocks. Well, I do anyways, but... <laughs> You would just do it with less grace. Yeah. Lumpfish. They have lumpfish at the Monterey Bay. What fish? A lumpfish. Yeah. They're Likewise, my absolute yeah, favorite, yeah, favorite yeah. creature. Yeah, let's don't take a quick look. Is. Look at this cute face. Go ahead, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, the frowny face. Yeah. Why do so many fish in the deep sea have frowny faces? But it can, like, change colors. Oh. And the cool thing is, like, uh, they can put their front pectoral fins together and make a suction cup. So they can suction onto rocks. So during big all storms. Right, that's good, thanks. When all the other okay, fish are like moving back and forth, they're just sitting out like chilling. I also just recently learned that they use lumpfish in salmon farming because they'll eat the parasites, like sea lice, off of the salmon and the other like farm raised fish. Lumpfish well. Yeah, I just recently found that out. Oh, it so they actively put them in fish farms as like parasite controls. Oh, that's good. Right? So what, so they don't just exist in the deep sea then? No, well, they exist, I don't know. Going back to when they started exploring the deep sea, uh, <laughs> the first actually deep sea <laughs> exploration was in the 1800s. The for a minute. So, oh, with the diving bells. It was uh, with the HMS Challenger. <gasps> yes, where it went down and it did like um, going around and around, dropping shelf. down the weights. Yeah, yeah, they did a bunch of stuff. They went all around the different oceans. Hence the name Challenger Deep. Mm -hmm. Okay, and can, um, uh, that's actually where they first the discovered nodules. Like it's that's the first fun. place oh. they discovered nodules because they were picking up those really dark colored rocks. I didn't think that they were actually picking it up. I thought they were just testing deepness. No, they have pictures, like old pictures. Yeah. They, they dragged nets and everything, too. They really wow. did an amazing job for the technology at hand in the 1870s. Yeah. Um, but up until Challenger, Forbes's azoic hypothesis really was the the current thought of the day that no life lived below 600 meters or so, or 600 fathoms, I forget which. Um, and uh, that life got progressively less and less abundant to whatever the magical number is, I forget, I think it was 600 fathoms. Um, and then there was no life below that at all. And it really wasn't until Challenger's expedition where they dragged nets and brought back a whole, well, whole host of life deeper than that, that uh, they realized the deep sea even had life in it at all. And 600,000 is just shy of 1,100 meters. 
Oh yeah, here's all the manganese nodules that they brought up. So cool. So yeah, generally people attribute Challenger to being the start of modern um, marine science. Green science? Marine. Marine, okay. It's like green science. <laughs> like That's young science. <laughs> Going back in the history though, oh, one oh. of the kind of interesting historical um, tidbits was that's been kind of a little bit lost to popular science, popular history, is the U.S. Exploration Expedition, which I believe was the 1840s. Um, it was not that far after um, Lewis and Clark's projects. Within a couple decades, um, the U.S. government sent a, uh, a flotilla on a circumnavigation of the globe to um, explore and document things. And it was really, they made the first maps of the San Francisco Bay, they made some of the first maps of several of the um, Pacific Islands. They are credited with discovering Antarctica as a continent and wow, not just oh a group nice. of islands. Um, I think they were gone four years, but wow. when they returned, they there was a huge scandal where all the officers hated each other <gasps> and they all lodged court-martial challenges with each other. Uh, and so it, it kind of got swept under the rug, frankly. Um, and it wasn't wasn't met with the f uh, fanfare and excitement that other projects were because there was so much scandal around um, the Commodore uh, Wilkes, Lieutenant Wilkes was the one running the show. And uh, he is not a very good people manager, basically. Mm. Um, Ooh. But was there like a mutiny or something? Wasn't so far as a mutiny, but yeah, there was a lot of problems. Um, and, um, but the data that came back and all the samples, they actually created the Smithsonian in order to handle all of the samples from that expedition. That is interesting. That's um, awesome. So they're like at the Natural History Museum somewhere? Yep, but it was the, the first of the Smithsonian's. Oh, wow. So this is in Is this a predatory like tree Uh I don't think so. I think this is a sponge. Darn it. <laughs> Can I push right in? But I'm not 100% sure yet, but it's got benthictinophores, which are one of my favorite deep sea organisms. Oh, yeah. So I think this is a, some type of caliphacus sponge um, with what looks like three benthictinophores. And you can see their feeding tentacles out. So they have two, one of those things just about oh. uh, one group of, tena one of the major branches of tenophores, uh, have tenaculata, have these um, feeding tentacles they stream out. And each one has two. Uh, and you can see, you can see that these both seem to only have one. one out each. They're not so hungry. Only it looks, they're just snacking. <laughs> can they grow their tentacles back? I believe so. Yes. I'm just trying to think if I was on this boat with y'all for four years. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, this is a small boat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I believe there was four or six vessels in the group, and so you could at least sometimes move from one move ship from to one the other, maybe. Man, I that's love you all to death, but after four years. Yeah, four years is a long yeah. time. And that's four years with no air conditioning, Ooh. no internet. No internet. <laughs> God. I know. We lost internet for 30 minutes the other day. I and know, it was like, and I oh, was Jesus. like. <laughs> we all had to play cards. It was terrible. Yeah. I know. We had to talk to each other. We, Gross. We did an entire puzzle. Like. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I've taken students to a field camp in Belize a few times that has no internet. And it is quite traumatizing sometimes, <laughs> I have to admit. Like, every time we went, we had at least one out of 30 students that like, really actually struggled from internet withdrawal. 
while we were in the field for two and a half weeks. I think eventually I could get over it. However, sometimes when you're thinking about something and you like really want to know the answer quickly, I always just Google it and not being able to do it and have to think for a really long time about it would frustrate yeah. me so much. One thing I do have to say is we have the Padre Island National Seashore and there is no internet out there. And it's so nice to just like get away. Nobody can contact you. You can't contact anybody. Just, it's really, really nice, but longer than a day, that's tough. Mm -hmm. That's really, really tough. Yeah. I have to admit for work, I'm very excited about the explosion of low earth orbiting satellites and the increased bandwidth they're going to bring to every corner of the planet with a satellite dish that fits in the palm of your hand or is no bigger than a laptop, Whoa. which I'm very excited about being able to have that level of connectivity for doing this type of work without needing a 12 foot dish that weighs a couple thousand pounds to hang off the back of the boat. <laughs> but, um, but the other part of me is a little sad because I'll never be able to escape again. Yeah. That's a piece of engineering technology that is not appreciated en by any enough at all is the VSATs that make telepresence work. VSAT stands for very small aperture terminal, satellite terminal. Um, and the, the system we have on this ship is a, a 2.4 meter dish. And so, or, and, uh, so not quite 10 feet. Um, and it, uh, it has stabilized in such a way that with up to a pretty moderate sea state, it can maintain a tenth of a degree beam um, lock on a satellite orbiting 23,000 miles above us, um, no matter what the ship is doing, rolling on all three axes uh, continuously. And it's really an amazing piece of technology. And it is balanced so to the point that a single like penny somewhere on it will throw it out of balance. And it's yeah. quite the ordeal where you're sitting there with individual washers, putting them on different places on the dish to make sure it's balanced properly. What is this bamboo coral sitting on? That's a very unique rock. Is I it know. another whale fossil? That would, be a, that would be a very big whale. New whale species Not entirely. Not outside their own possibility, but a big one. Now, we see these two different colors black sometimes. Yeah, that's what I did. And I haven't figured out what that change is between we get these kind of b blacker black rocks and lighter black rocks that seem to occur on near the tops of these seamounts. I'm trying to, here, let me look back at my picture. From my angle, it kind of looked like it was sticking out a little bit more than the other rocks. Like this one was also a little bit more black. I think it might just be like the level of sediment on top of it. Totally possible, yeah. Like it's, if it sticks out a little bit more, the current is getting to it more. It's getting rid of some of the sediment and possibly eroding a little bit of the rock. Because this, honestly, right here looks like a little bit of erosion. Oh, that's cool. Come up uh, five minutes away. Is that an anemone? Yeah, it looks like an anemone under the overhang and then one of these uh, Chrysogorgias um, on the back side of this rock. Oh. Oh, oh. Sea urchin. Is that a worm? No, is no, that a dead, dead coral? Yeah. Is but the sea urchin, urchin looked really cool. Yeah. Have you seen urchin? Yeah, uh, underneath that rock, see it? That's a, an anemone, I believe. Really? I think so. Could definitely be wrong. Corley, can you zoom back in on your master still camera? I think yeah, it. you're right. You're right. Sea urchin. Or sorry, sea anemone. Do you know when you were in middle school and people would do that thing? Like high five, <laughs> Yes, I do know when they would do that thing. In the middle too slow? 
Or like sometimes they'd be like high five and then they'd be like jellyfish. Or I like just learned the jellyfish the other night from uh, Deck Chief Mike. No way, you just learned I that? I just learned that I've one. I've never seen the, jelly, the jellyfish version. You ready? You ready? <laughs> 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 or like I remember. Uh, oh wait, no, but then you got to do like, here, can I have a hug? Oh, big jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> And or then, like, okay, it's or right. like the high five, and then it's just see an enemy. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> so, science, this is another paragorgia. <laughs> <laughs> Enough with that. kids these days, they're just like not getting bullied enough like we, we used to. <laughs> Hot takes by Corley. Is that, I was is like, that maybe just don't a say that on SPL. I can't tell. Sorry, what? This thing right here, I can't tell if that's just a shadow or if that's a coral. Zoom in there for a second, uh, Daryl. I got a text and drive here. I can uh, push in a bit more. Great. I think this is a baby bamboo. Just a baby. Still needs a bottle and a nappy. All right, back row's good whenever. Right. <laughs> Daryl, we have a Our, very uh, nerdy question Sparky for you. Is, uh, still observing him. Sicking Robert on him. Go ahead. All right, so the nerdy question is... Uh, Come up, Buck. In what format is the video encoded? And is it sent out over a satellite? Is it H264? H264. And then what is the bit rate? Actually don't know that part. And is this sent to the Inner Space Center first, or does it go straight out to the world? I know it used to be sent to the Inner Space. Actually don't know that answer. That's specifically not my mm -hmm. area that I would know specifically for, specifically uh, for. I don't think it goes out to the Inner Space Center anymore, but I do know that it used to. I think now it's just live. Yeah, it might be directly through the internet. Yeah, I think so. I don't handle that portion. I'm watching the stream, making sure this here is physically going out. I don't actually see when it goes out. Gotcha, thank you. But yes, I do know the format, H264. If anyone from the Monterey Bay Aquarium is listening, why don't you guys have discounted passes for students? <laughs> Just wondering. This has been another hot take with Corley. They have like a discounted like member pass for students, but it says only college students. So does that, grad, um, grad students are yeah. students too. So I don't know if it counts us, but sometimes a lot of student memberships are for younger people and I don't qualify. I think you would totally qualify. If you show up with any kind of college ID, you're gonna get a discounted ticket. Hopefully. I know I've used my Finland library card for student discounts before, because it was written in Finnish. <laughs> and so nobody, <laughs> nobody questioned it.
Hey, Lynette, I have a question for you. I can see you're so excited. What's up? <laughs> can I ask what happened to your friend um, on the back deck last night? Your little birdie friend? Oh, she flew away. Oh, yay. Yeah. She enjoyed, like, your little nest that you made her and everything? Mm hmm Aww. I think so. And then this morning you woke up and she was like, thanks. She I, just I needed to away. dry her feet off. Do you and know, was it a, uh, a booby? Like a mast booby? It was a uh, petrol. Bowers petrol. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lynette. You're welcome. <laughs> I just learned something new about, I don't use ICP OES, but apparently ICP OES can't measure metals down to the parts per trillion like ICP MS can. So add. Those are letters that you just strung together. This is like how the, um, how Monterey Bay Aquarium measures their trace metals. They're not getting it down to the parts per trillion, so. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, that, uh, that look on my face is I have no idea. You could have just said like random letters and made up some stuff and I would have been, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's half of what this philosophy of science is, is you just. Uh, Start stringing some make, stuff together. Yeah, make say some it with things confidence. sound like Latin and say it with confidence. <laughs> <laughs> So if this dive is supposed to be 18 hours and we launched at 9. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be shorter. We're shortening it. Oh, okay. What time do we expect to be out? Because we're making such good time. Um, midnight? Probably sometime between 10 and midnight at this rate. Okay. Maybe even a little earlier than that. We've made it halfway to the summit from when we took over three hours ago. So leave bottom and we'll say three more hours which will be a little 10-ish, and then an hour, hour and a half to the surface, so we have probably midnight recovery. And yeah, they only have about 200-ish meters of elevation left. It should steepen up a touch, not a whole lot, but a touch. Oh yeah. More before we get to the summit. summit. Man, what Is am I gonna do? Is I can actually sleep in two nights in a row. Can I raise him? Sure. Oh, and a, a sea cucumber. Oh, or something. Well, you can is, get yeah. up at midnight and process samples, Katie, if you want. Yeah. I might. I really and truly might. But I don't know if I'd just be one extra person in there, like another body taking up oxygen, or if I would yeah, actually I be should. able to help. That's good enough for us. Thanks. I mean, I don't know. I think it. Yeah, sure. It, it's so interesting because I've sailed with three different science managers and each one has a very different way for how they work Do it in the all lab. Yeah. yeah, so it's really interesting. Come up five foot. See the change? So midnight, you might see me again, full of energy and coffee. <laughs> Uh, you drink coffee at midnight? Heck yeah. Do you not? Like when we do our 4 a.m. shift, do you not drink any coffee? I... I cannot, unfortunately. You go tighter if oh. you want. I, See I have a hard time drinking coffee on an empty stomach. It does hurt a little bit. It just like, it gives me kind of bad headaches. Which is actually, I think, a, it's a caffeine withdrawal. Yeah. If I don't get, yeah. If I don't eat anything. I was going to say, if I don't drink enough coffee, I will definitely go through caffeine withdrawals. Science is happy, thanks. Roger. I like this um, ombre Just effect that this sea cucumber has. This what? The Purple hell? ombre effect. Yeah. Put so in the chat if you think I should dye my hair okay. in this color. <laughs> I mean, more power to you if you want to dye that color. I've been watching the TV show Claws, where it's all about like nails and like really Ooh. crazy nails. I'm like, 
That would actually be a cool long nail. Yeah, that would. Too bad I can't have long nails. I can't, manganese cr I can't work with the rocks. I was going to say, what? who can actually have like really nice long nails? Because I definitely can't either. It's like... Um, <laughs> I'm kind of <laughs> jealous because I want it like, it's so cool to see all the amazing nails and like... It's just like people creativity. who don't really work with their hands. Consultants. Yeah. Um, like like bank banking people, finance people. Yeah, but then they have to type a lot. Some finance people don't type at all. They're just in charge of keeping clients happy. I'm oh. trying to think of my friends who have long nails. Like, what do they do? I Some doctors, depending, like, site. What they do. Um, I know a lot of people, that's, like, a huge thing. Like, getting your nails done once a week, once every other week. Yeah. And I've always, like, m enjoyed getting to be a part of that culture, but I'd always have to get pedicures instead of manicures. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Deep thoughts. Yeah, deep <laughs> What about purple with orange highlights? Orange highlights? Yes. <laughs> I don't think that's a I good... Know. I it's, don't know. It's giving Halloween, I think. Especially if you added like a green into it. Okay. Which I know a lot of people, Halloween is their favorite holiday. And I, I do really like Halloween, but... That'll be our question for the next shift. Not, what's your oh, favorite what's holiday? Your, yeah. So that's Ren, if you're one. listening, that'll be the question for next time. <laughs> I'll try to come up with a charismatic and witty answer. You all can blame me for this. I picked this dive site. <laughs> you know what? No, I'm actually glad that you picked this one because I feel like this is evening the scales of karma because we've just seen everything cool on a, on this expedition has happened on this shift. So you know what? We gotta we gotta even the playing field. Gotta have a boring dive. No whale fossils, no octopus, no radiolarian. Just rocks. The exciting world of rocks. It is exciting. Except even our geologist doesn't seem that excited. <laughs> Wait, I just said it's exciting. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh, did I show you the video of them firing up the laser earlier? Um, no. Oh, it's so cool. So for those listening, not the next dive, but probably the one after that. We are going to be using the Roman spectrometer again. And I got to watch them firing it up in the lab earlier today. And I was so incredibly impressed. So there's the rock that... Where was this? What lab was this in? The data lab. Oh, wow. But yeah, it's that ferromanganese encrusted rock that we got to cut with the rock saw. And then... There it goes. Wait for it. Oh, wow. And then see the smoke. Oh, wow. I have to admit, I'm very surprised that this is this devoid of life. Isn't that so cool? It's steep enough. There's plenty of exposed awesome. hard grounds. I had to put on like special safety <coughs> glasses and everything yeah. for it. We've That's been cool. seeing a current out right of the there. north. We should be well into the current now. There's We're a in a depth zone that generally is pretty good for corals. I am very surprised at how... Let's look at the sponge on the right, if you don't mind. Um, I'm very surprised we're not seeing more life here. I'm kind of baffled by it. This really should be pretty good territory for it. What'll be, it. Like what'll be real is curious is right when we get to the summit here, if there's a whole high density community sitting on the top of this thing or not. New paper? Is this a new paper you could write? Cause, right? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm built, maybe, yes. <laughs> the, problem, the problem is we don't have current logging. Like oh. I really need current information. So this is a glass sponge, potentially a young bolosoma. Um, it's hard for me to tell. Sorry, but I'm no, I mean it's just hard for me to tell because it's hard for me to tell identify sponges. <laughs> 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 uh, not because of the image. 
Go tank. It's and still it hard to tell. Yep. <laughs> Actually, I take that back. I don't think this is a Volosoma, but I'm not sure what it is without going through all my notes. But that's good enough for me to go through my notes later, I so did. thank you. Oh, wait. <laughs> but yeah, this is what I commented a couple dives ago about really wanting um, current monitoring on ROVs um, or science ROVs as kind of a standard piece of equipment would really help me understand why places like this that otherwise look like really ripe uh, habitat uh, are pretty devoid of life. I can spec one out for you. I got a checkbook. Yeah, that's my problem. <laughs> I know the technology exists. I just don't have the money. It's only 20 grand or so. <laughs> By deep sea science standards, that's pretty cheap. Uh, what's that shadow? Oh, there it is. Ooh. Oh, fish. Is that a, okay, let me guess, Cuskiel. Yep, oh. yep, Cuskiel. <laughs> I was going to guess a Cuskiel before you started saying this time on it. It's getting steeper here. Thank you. Oh, Ooh, close up. More like extreme close up. <laughs> are Cuskills all? Do they are they also blind or? No. Nope. Okay. Okay, so they can see us. Uh, in they theory. Have some. Light sensing? Yes. Whether they have like true image forming or whatnot, I don't know. But they definitely can are aware of light. Resingent sea star here. Brian, can you tell us a little bit about how sea stars are not sea stars? Good lord. Uh, sea sponges reproduce. In all honesty, no. <laughs> I'd have to go do a little research on that one. Yeah, I don't remember. I got it. Come up, I... My undergraduate invertebrate zoology instructor would be very, very disappointed with me, but I don't remember the details of it. Thank you for a very honest answer. Yeah. Science is a system, not an aggregate of facts which I think a lot of people, including scientists, forget sometimes that that the idea of being able to discover knowledge and look it up and use it is kind of what science is, not being the repository of all random factoids. But you're really good at having like an encyclopedic knowledge of everything deep sea. Broad breath, short depth. <laughs> Come uh, right 10 degrees too, please. This is likely another Paragorgia. I've been seeing a fair number of these. The, uh, the question of re reproduction in the deep sea is kind of interesting because they control the, they mainly have, they have some form of larval form that's free swimming or moving and how long um, corals or sponges stay in that larval form or how long their gametes are viable once they get expelled controls a lot of the genetic connectivity here and we really are just beginning to start to understand how long um, these can live in the plankton and move around and, uh, and for a lot of the species it's quite a long time um, but it's really important when you think about in some areas how sparse seamounts are even more so with chemosynthetic communities how sparse those are that having gene flow hundreds or even thousands of miles sometimes from one hydrothermal complex to another um, is really super important for understanding the connectivity of, of these ecosystems and how interconnected they are. Um, and so that's a, there's a decent amount of work being done on that in different places, but like all things deep sea, it's trying to catch one of these things spawning is, is just about impossible because of the constraints of being here and the timing, and we have no idea how often they spawn. Um, you know, shallow water corals spawn, or many of them spawn on a very regular, very predictable time that you can know within the hour, 
when mm -hmm. they're going to spawn based on um, the lunar cycle. And we really don't know if there's an analog in the deep sea or not. And then some of these appear to be brooders, so they actually um, keep their, their um, larvae pretty close and don't necessarily do long-range broadcasts. So there's much, 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 much to more to be known about the deep sea and, and reproduction that's really kind of critical, frankly, for our understanding of how to manage these ecosystems and conserve them. And we don't know how far uh, a flung they can actually repopulate from one community to another. So it's on my bucket list to dive the flower gardens in the Gulf when they're spawning. Absolutely. Yes, please. That is, that is pretty high on my list as well. I so dove the flower robust. gardens. It was incredible. Absolutely incredible. But I want to do it when they're it, spawning. It flattened out a bit there. I thought it was getting steeper. If you That's not a paracord here, Chris. Yeah, I've got a, a good friend of mine who went to grad school with, and she's done some work out there for spawning at Come Flower Gardens. Please. Said it was pretty amazing. We go home 15 to 20 here. Longer tether. Yeah, it's crazy because, like, for the lay person, it's really pretty reasonable. So it's a thousand bucks to do the scuba diving, like, on a regular weekend. You go out Friday night, you get back Sunday afternoon. And then to do the spawning, it's about an extra two hundred, four hundred dollars more. My my next big dive trip is kelp diving or cold water California diving, which I've never done before. Gonna go out to Santa Barbara for a couple a couple weeks after we get back from this expedition. I'm going to go spend a week in Santa Barbara diving the Channel Islands. Ren, you've dove kelp forest, haven't you? Yep, I grew up diving in Monterey, right outside the aquarium. Really? Yeah. Had the reed breather and everything. Oh, I never used a CCR. Oh, I thought you got uh, certified on it. No, I'd love to though. Uh, diving cold water is great. It's a completely different game from diving in the tropics in a good way. Except you have to dress up like a seal. <laughs> yeah, I, I gave up and started using a dry suit at some point. I've never gotten comfortable in a dry suit. I can't get the undergarments right. I just always end up being cold and wet anyways. If it's, if it's, if it's anywhere near survivable, I'll wear a seven mil and not switch to a dry suit until it's in the 40s. Jeez, that sounds like good misery. Well, the coldest dive I ever did, literally, like computer read 28. Good God. And there was a light, light layer of ice on Narragansett Bay. We were getting ready to sail on another ship and one of the sonars was misbehaving and so two of us had to jump in the water and go check the underwater connections between the, the transducer and the ship in January in Rhode Island. A little tiny sponge. There, there. Yeah, it looks like it. Baby sponge. That was the coldest I've ever been in my life, unquestionably. Oh. Yeah, a little stalk sponge yeah. with something, or maybe not something. Maybe I was looking. Nope, I was just looking at sediment behind it. So my blood is too thin for that. All right, anything, we're good. Thanks, Dan. Okay, go away. Thanks. Anything below seventy, I I tap out. That's too cold for me. I, I just get into wetsuits real quick, or and we're roaming up the the thickness of the wetsuit pretty quickly. But, but yeah, I don't I don't recommend 28 degrees. It's too cold. Leela uh, from the other watch is a, a very accomplished uh, diver in Antarctica. She goes down and di science dives down there sure. on different projects. So she's an she's an expert in that kind of cold water diving. Oh no, no, thank you. I will pass. I'm glad that people can do that, though, not for me.
Oh, yeah. To the viewer that's uh, in Hawaii talking about no AC, I feel yeah, I have zero tolerance to cold myself. Well, at least this dive's going to be quick to annotate. <laughs> yeah. Silver linings. You probably like annotating the video. Honestly, no. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a chore. It's one of those things that when I'm doing it, I'm just like sitting there the whole time being like, can't wait till the machines are smart enough to do this for me. What do you have to do when you're annotating? Like, just write down, this is a Chrysogorgia, this is a Eritophor, or no, pretty much. Eritogorgia. Yeah, pretty much. Generally, we'll, depending on exactly what we're doing, there'll be some other, like, we we'll, might make an assessment of how much tissue is dead or what's living on it and things like that as well. Um. There also has to be a little bit of finesse, because, for instance, sometimes when we're diving, we'll, like, see a really cool rock that has a bunch of stuff on it. And I remember one time we just kept circling around uh -huh. the rock, like around and around. And Megan Potts, who also annotates um, videos, was kind of like, oh, this is going to be really <laughs> <laughs> difficult to annotate because like, you're trying to count everything that's there. But it's like, did we, we already see that? Times, we, yep. Yeah, <laughs> did we already like see that already? So kind of have to keep a track of everything. I keep looking at the stern camera and just seeing that smiley face as the sun is setting. It's so cute. <laughs> I don't think you can. I was like, oh, maybe you could see it. On I'll the bring it no. up on Sat3 three. Three for you guys. Oh, thank you, Daryl. Make sure I don't mess around with the wall this time. There you guys go. There's your smiley face. Sat three. <laughs> that's so cute. Sunset in the background. There you yeah, go. Yeah, that's perfect. Even the boat is happy we're out exploring. <laughs> Do you want me to turn the screen? Oh, thank you. Man, we have an accomplished like diver on board. Little Chrysogorgi as we've been seeing. One of our viewers says that in the past 40 years, they have done 4,000 plus dives. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It must be like a dive master yeah. or something. I was uh, the dive buddy for someone who did their fourth or fifth, I think it was dive 4,000 or 5,000. Wow. I was her, her buddy, and she lived in a small island in the Marshall Islands, and there was basically all they had to do was a dive. She'd get off work and just go diving just about every day. That's and awesome. And she'd lived on, on Kwajalein for 20 some, almost 20 years, I think, or something like that. And she'd gone to Honduras um, to celebrate, to do her 4,000th dive um, as a vacation. That's awesome. I love that. 
I was really bummed. I ended up in Kwajalein on a research vessel a few years later, and she had just moved off island oh, no. like six <laughs> months before I got there. I was really excited that I was going to like show up and be like, hi, remember me? <laughs> uh, and then I found out she'd left. Diving in Honduras is some of the best diving I've ever done. Because you can just snorkel and it's, the coral is so close. Would you guys ever go, what is it, spelunking? Spelunking? Yeah, cave diving? Cave diving? Yes. Uh, I, yes. I've never officially done cave diving, but I've gone way into some, a couple caverns and cenotes. It's I've done very shallow stuff like, oh, it goes in one, two feet. Let's do this. What, did, what were you saying, Brian? Sorry. I was just saying that that was the cenotes in, in the Yucatan of Mexico is definitely on the top five list of all, best dives ever. Yeah, I'd love to go check those out. Yeah, someday. it's well worth it. Chris, do you ever get to go scuba diving in Palmyra? Uh, they don't really let us dive there. Oh. <laughs> But I've been a couple of times, but it's, yeah, we're not supposed to do too much. Is it for safety or like, do you have to go further out with the corals? Um, it's because it's so remote. If something happens, oh, they don't oh, want. Okay. So, but people could come out and do their research. And if you pay a lot of money, like a donor, then you can come out and dive, but. Gotcha. When you have a research team come out, do they bring a micro light or something like a, their own hyperbaric chamber? No. Okay. no. All right, this is a bamboo whip. We've seen a few of these earlier in the dive as well. All right, that's all science needs. Thanks. Roger. Play some shrimps around too. I should have brought my jacket up for this watch. Definitely a little chilly. Started out at 74 and no, now we're at 71 you. degrees. Doing all right. Maybe I could get my jacket it's up. What, 71 you said? It, when we started it was 74 degrees. It has dropped to 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that makes sense. Because when we first caught it and I was like, I wasn't cold. Our units are actually working. I'm happy. Yay. That's not like a shocking thing. They're normally working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, having that fail is really bad, like really, really bad. So we mm. try not to have a repeat. I was on another vessel in the Caribbean and the whole ship's cooling system went down. Oh, jeez. It was like 110 inside. We all slept on the deck. <laughs> That's kind of fun. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> That's like when people say they want to go near Palmyra so the boobies will come on board, and I'm just like, no, <laughs> absolutely not. We've had a few cruising around, a few mask boobies, and uh, that have been sticking around the ship almost the entire cruise so far. I kind of want them to land just to say, hey, what's going on? A they couple of them, they're, I'm they're fine. Yeah. yeah. Like five million, I'm not <laughs> fine. <laughs> I'm not trying to get Hitchcock.